Many chemical reactions are reversible, which facilitates an important phenomenon known as chemical equilibrium. This exists when the forward rate of a chemical reaction equals its reverse rate. Chemical equilibria are dynamic, meaning that they are active. Each reactant is being put back by the reverse reaction at the same rate that it is being used up by the forward reaction, and vice versa for each product. This is why the concentrations of reactants and products remain constant with time. An example of an equilibrium reaction is shown below. The coefficients in the balanced equation provide the consumption and production ratios. We can see that nitrogen dioxide is being consumed and produced at twice the rate dinitrogen tetroxide is. There are several criteria for a system to be at chemical equilibrium. Here are some of the most important. The first is that it must have constant macroscopic properties. Macroscopic properties are those that are large enough to be measured or observed with the unaided eye. The system must also be closed. When conditions are changed, the system must shift. There are some other criteria for a reaction to be at chemical equilibrium that we will also list here. The system is dynamic. It must have an equal forward and reverse rate. And finally, the system is able to approach equilibrium from either direction. A system at equilibrium has constant macroscopic properties, such as the color, pH, temperature, and pressure, because the amount of each reactant and product remains constant. Each chemical is being produced at the same rate that it is being consumed. Another notable characteristic of equilibria is that they are self-perpetuating. This is because the forward and reverse reactions continuously supply each other with reactants. For a system to be closed, there must be no chemicals entering or leaving the system. If a system's properties are constant but it is open, then it's a steady state rather than an equilibrium. In a steady state, components enter and leave the system at the same rate rather than going back and forth within an equilibrium system. For a system to be at equilibrium, it must be closed and at a constant temperature. In other words, the amount of matter and energy is held constant within the system. Of the systems that meet the first criteria, equilibrium does not exist in a large percentage. In most of these, there is really nothing happening, and they are just chemical mixtures. Just as a child might poke a snake to see if it's alive, chemists poke chemical systems by changing their conditions. On the left, we have a diagrammatic representation of a chemical equilibrium being established. As the reaction begins, high concentrations of reactants generate a fast forward reaction. The forward rate falls as the concentrations of the reactants decrease. Meanwhile, the reverse rate rises along with the concentrations of products. The rates and concentrations continue to change until the reverse rate equals the forward rate, thereby establishing equilibrium. On the right, we have a graph of the reactant and product concentrations versus time. Once the concentrations become constant, equilibrium is established. While the forward and reverse rate might be equal at equilibrium, the concentrations of reactants and products are not required to be. They are just constant. Le Chatelier's principle states that an equilibrium system subjected to a stress will shift to partially alleviate the stress and restore equilibrium. Basically, when an equilibrium system is disrupted, it will shift its reactant and product concentrations, changing one into the other to reduce the disruption and re-establish equilibrium. When a quantity of reactant or product is added to an equilibrium system, the system will shift to remove some of the added chemical. When a quantity is removed, the system will shift to restore some of the removed chemical. Another expression for shift is to momentarily proceed towards, which is actually preferred by readers of the AP exam. Now for some terms that we should become familiar with. An equilibrium system is a reacting system that is at or approaching equilibrium. A stress is any action that disrupts the equilibrium by having a different effect on the forward reaction rate than it does on the reverse reaction rate. A right shift is the system's response of changing some reactants into products, while a left shift is the opposite. This problem involves the addition of a reactant. Here it is hydrogen iodide gas that is being added. For these problems, it might be a good exercise to pause the video and to try and answer the question on your own before the answers are shown. First, we will look at which direction the system will shift to restore equilibrium. The system will consume some of the added hydrogen iodide so it will shift left, toward the reactants. Next, we need to look at how the concentrations of each substance have changed. Although the system has shifted to remove some of the added hydrogen iodide, it will not remove all the added hydrogen iodide. The concentration of hydrogen iodide will have increased. Since the reaction shifted left, 
the concentrations of hydrogen and iodine have increased as well. Here we are dealing with the same reaction, but this time some hydrogen has been removed. The system must shift left to replace some of the removed hydrogen. Since not all of the removed hydrogen will be replaced, the concentration of hydrogen will decrease. The concentration of hydrogen iodide will also decrease as we have shifted left. A shift towards a reactant increases the concentration of iodine. A disrupted or stressed equilibrium system is no longer at equilibrium because its forward and reverse reaction rates are not equal. For example, what happens when we add some iron-3 ions to the equation below? The reaction will momentarily proceed in the forward direction to remove some of the added ions. The diagram and graph here can help illustrate what is happening with the reaction. The forward rate is a solid line while the reverse rate is a dotted line. On the diagram to the left we see that at the initial equilibrium, EI, the forward and reverse rate are equal. We can label the forward rate as RF and the reverse rate as RR. The stress, S, causes an immediate increase in the forward rate while the reverse rate initially remains unaffected. The forward rate then decreases while the reverse rate increases until equilibrium is once again established. This final re-established equilibrium, EF, shows the forward and reverse rates as equal again with a magnitude somewhere in between the initial and stressed rates. Now let's turn to the rate versus time graph on the right. The spike is when the stress is added to the system and the forward rate is increased. After the spike, we see how the reverse rate rises and the forward rate decreases to become equal. In heterogeneous reactions, since both forward and reverse reactions occur at the same surface, an increase in surface area increases the forward and reverse rates equally. Therefore, increasing surface area at equilibrium has no effect on the equilibrium concentrations of the reactants and products. Adding a catalyst will increase the forward and reverse reaction rates equally and has no effect on the position of the equilibrium either. While neither of these two changes will result in a shift, they both cause the system to reach equilibrium sooner. The phrase equilibrium position refers to the relative concentrations of reactants and products at equilibrium and is usually expressed as percent yield. When an equilibrium system shifts to remove some of an added chemical or to replace some of a removed chemical, the system may overshoot or undershoot the original equilibrium position. The equilibrium position shifted right means that the system has a greater percent yield than it had at the previous equilibrium. The expression, products are favored, means the equilibrium has a greater than 50% yield. This means that more than half of the limiting reactant has been converted into product. To take a closer look at the equilibrium position, consider the following equilibrium system. HP is yellow while P- ions are blue. A green solution indicates equal concentrations of HP and P- and therefore a 50% yield. If we added some yellow HP to a green equilibrium mixture, the system will proceed to the right to remove some of the added HP. However, when equilibrium is restored, the solution is still yellow so we know that the equilibrium position has shifted left. This doesn't mean the system has proceeded to the left though. There is a difference between the equilibrium system shifting in response to a stress, as described by Le Chatelier's principle, and the equilibrium position shifting as a possible result. Here we know that the system proceeded to the right, but the equilibrium position shifted left. Equilibria are often linked through one chemical common to both. In this example, we are asked to describe how the concentration of copper II ions will be affected by adding some hydrogen ions to this coupled system. When hydrogen ions are added, equilibrium II will proceed downwards to remove some of them. This will cause the concentration of ammonia to decrease. Equilibrium 1 will respond to this stress by proceeding to the left to restore some of the lost ammonia. Evidently, proceeding to the left would increase the concentration of copper II ions. So far, we have discussed how equilibria respond to changing the concentrations of a single species. A change in volume changes all the reactants and products' concentrations. The volume of a gaseous system can be changed by compressing or decompressing it, while the volume of an aqueous system can be changed by evaporating water from it or by diluting it. Equilibria respond to volume changes by shifting to relieve some of the added pressure, or to replace some of the lost pressure. Osmotic pressure is defined as the pressure that just stops osmosis through a semi-permeable membrane. A detailed examination of osmosis is not required in this course. The main thing to note is that osmotic pressure is to dissolve particles what gas pressure is to gas particles. 
For example, decompressing a gas lowers its gas pressure. This is Boyle's law. An increase in volume causes a decrease in pressure. Likewise, diluting a solute lowers its osmotic pressure. Partial pressure is the gas's part of the total gas pressure or the pressure exerted by this gas alone in a mixture of gases. A gas's partial pressure is proportional to its concentration. Dalton's law of partial pressure states that if you were to sum all of the partial pressures of a gas mixture, the result would be the total pressure of the mixture. The equation on the left shows us that the partial pressure of a gas is proportional to its mole fraction. Multiplying the total pressure of a gas mixture by the moles of one of the gases divided by the total moles of gas is equal to that gas's partial pressure. The equation on the right shows us that the total pressure is equal to the sum of all the partial pressures. To illustrate these concepts further, we'll take a look at a problem. In what direction will the system shift when it is diluted? The Chatelier's principle says that equilibrium will be restored by replacing some of the lost osmotic pressure, but not all of it. This means the system will need to shift left as there are more aqueous particles on the left side of the equation. We next will take a look at what has happened to the number and concentration of each particle. Be careful, these are two different things. The system was diluted, so only the system's response to the stress and not the stress itself changes the number of particles. A shift left increases the number of hydrogen and nitrate ions and decreases the number of nitrous acid molecules. On the other hand, the stress itself will change the concentrations. Since the system was diluted, all the concentrations are lower at the new equilibrium. If the system here is compressed, which way will the system shift or proceed? Right away we notice that there are two moles of gas on either side of the equation. In fact, this reaction will not respond to a volume change. It cannot partially restore the pressure by proceeding in either direction, since there are the same number of gas particles on each side of the equation. When the volume of an equilibrium system changes, all the reactant and product concentrations change proportionately. Nevertheless, the forward and reverse reaction rates may change by different amounts. In other words, they may become unequal. The direction, forward or reverse, that has the greater sum of gaseous or aqueous reactant coefficients is the more sensitive of the two directions to volume changes. For example, if volume increases, then that more sensitive direction will experience a greater increase in rate. Reactant concentrations and temperature are the only external factors that affect reaction rates. A pressure change only stresses an equilibrium if the pressure change reflects a change in the reactant and product concentrations. We can change the pressure without changing the concentrations, for example, by adding an inert gas to the system. Inert means not reacting in any way with species present. This pressure change does not reflect any change of reactant or product concentrations, so it does not affect the equilibrium. The noble gas family was once known as the inert gas family as it was believed that all noble gases were entirely inert to chemical combination. However, in 1962, Neil Bartlett reacted fluorine with xenon at the University of British Columbia, demonstrating that noble gases could react. The addition of a noble gas will not affect the equilibrium. This is a continuation of the nitrous acid problem we just took a look at. Here we are asked to explain in terms of the forward and reverse reaction rates how the equilibrium system below would respond to being diluted. Diluting is going to decrease both the forward and reverse rate, but the forward rate will decrease more than the reverse rate. The result of this will be a net reverse reaction, also known as a left shift. Once again, we need to explain a system's response in terms of both the forward and reverse reaction rates. The system is compressed, but there are equal moles of gas on either side of the equation. A compression will increase both reaction rates to the same extent, and thus will not disrupt the equilibrium. When temperatures change, equilibria respond by shifting to remove some of the added kinetic energy or to replace some of the removed kinetic energy. If we are working with a thermochemical equation, where the enthalpy change is included in the equation, the kinetic energy can be treated just as though it were a chemical. If the forward and reverse reactions have the same collision geometry requirements, then their rates depend entirely on the frequency of collisions possessing the activation energy. The frequencies must be the same for both reactions since the forward and reverse reaction rates are equal. The percentage of area under a collision energy distribution curve that is at or beyond the activation energy represents the percentage of collisions that have enough energy to react. These diagrams are for an endothermic reaction. 
Note that the activation energy for the endothermic or forward direction is larger than the activation energy for the exothermic or reverse direction, as we can see on the left. On the right, we see that there is a smaller percentage of collisions possessing the endothermic or forward activation energy than the exothermic or reverse activation energy, which makes sense, as the forward activation energy is higher. Because of this, the forward reaction must have a greater frequency of collisions than the reverse direction, or else the reactions would not have the same number of successful collisions and the rates would not be equal. The endothermic direction has the harder task due to its higher activation energy. This means it benefits more from the assistance provided by an increase in temperature, and will be hindered more by a decrease in temperature than the exothermic direction. Let's say we increase the temperature. The curve on the right will flatten out as more collisions will have higher energy. We see that the percentage of collisions possessing the activation energy for the exothermic or reverse reaction has approximately doubled. The initial area was shaded in gray and the new area is shaded in blue. On the other hand, the percentage of collisions possessing the activation energy for the endothermic or forward reaction has increased by around four or five times. The initial area was filled with black stripes while the new area is filled with orange stripes. As we can see, an equilibrium's endothermic direction is more sensitive to temperature changes than its exothermic direction due to the endothermic direction's greater activation energy. In other words, changing the temperature will have a greater effect on the rate of the endothermic reaction. For example, heating a system would increase the rate in the endothermic direction more than it would increase the rate in the exothermic direction. Here are some quick tips and additional bits of information to quickly go over. Temperature changes do not appear on plots of concentration versus time, so the system responds to an invisible stress. The temperature of a system cannot change rapidly, so the response begins before the stress is complete. On these graphs, all the lines will change gradually. The graph below shows how the equilibrium system involving nitrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen monoxide responds to a temperature change. Volume and concentration changes, on the other hand, can be very sudden. When a stress is a sudden volume change, all the lines on a concentration versus time graph spike up or down. If the stress is due to the addition or removal of a single species, then only one spike appears on the graph. When we increase the temperature of gases in a closed container, their pressure also increases, but this pressure change is irrelevant to the equilibrium. The same cannot be said for the other way around. The temperature change resulting from compression or decompression does affect the equilibrium. In these cases, unless stated otherwise, we will assume that the temperature was held constant. Almost all of the world's ammonia is produced via the Haber-Bosch process. For this process, lower temperatures produce a higher percent yield, as the reaction is exothermic, but the reaction proceeds at a lower rate. One way to help with this issue is by using a catalyst, which allows chemists to increase the reaction rate at a lower temperature that produces a higher percent yield. Another way is that nitrogen and hydrogen are continuously fed in at one location, while ammonia is continuously liquefied and removed at another. This keeps the forward rate high and the reverse rate low. Higher pressures will generate faster rates and push the reaction toward a higher percent yield, which more than compensates for the higher construction and operational costs of a high compression system. To tie together the concepts we've gone through so far, let's take a look at this question dealing with the reaction we were just looking at. The nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia are in a flask at equilibrium. Which of the following would result in a net increase in the partial pressure of nitrogen? Maybe try to select an answer before continuing the video. We know that adding an inert gas such as argon will not disrupt the equilibrium, nor will it change any of the partial pressures of the gases in the flask. If we add hydrogen to the flask, then the reaction will shift to the right to remove some of the added hydrogen. But this will decrease the amount of nitrogen at its partial pressure, so this is not the answer either. What if we remove heat from the system? The forward reaction is exothermic, so removing heat will cause the reaction to shift to the right to produce some more heat. This will decrease the concentration and partial pressure of the nitrogen. Similarly, removing some ammonia will cause a right shift to restore some of the lost ammonia. This will also decrease the partial pressure of the nitrogen. If we add a catalyst, the forward and reverse rates will increase, but the equilibrium will not be affected, and the partial pressure of the nitrogen will remain the same. What if we decrease the volume? Shifting to the right will reduce some of the increase in pressure. Sure, there is a right shift, but the stress will not completely be alleviated. At the new equilibrium, all the concentrations will be higher. In other words, the partial pressure of the nitrogen will have increased. <laughs>